Benchmark, the voice of business. Presented by LMD. On this edition of Benchmark, the Chief Executive Officer of Huawei Technologies Lanka, Shun Li Wang, is in the hot seat today as we explore the communications technology sector. Then Nielsen's Managing Director Sharam Pan discusses the LMD Nielsen Business Confluence Index, which remains at a virtual standstill. And LMD columnist Shiran Fernando wraps up the show with his take on Sri Lanka's macro outlook. That's the lineup for Benchmark. And welcome to yet another edition of our Big Picture Business Program Benchmark. I'm Savitri Rodrigo. Communication technology is in our focus today. And joining us to discuss some issues is Shunli Wang, the Chief Executive Officer of Huawei Technologies Lanka. Shunli, thank you so much for joining us on Benchmark today. When you look at the state of communication technology, what do you see? If you look at the current uh, state of uh, communication technologies, I would like to say, you know, what is the contribution which uh, telecommunication technology brings to this society? If you look at the market in terms of uh, uh, home broadband penetration and mobile uh, penetration in the whole island, home broadband is it was uh, 0.4 percent like uh, 12 years ago year 2005, which Huawei was the first time entered this market. And the mobile penetration at that time also was around 16%. But until now, you can imagine how much it changed. The home broadband uh, penetration is up to uh, 12%. And the mobile penetration is already over 100%, is up to 112% in this market. This is a huge achievement. And also if you look at the whole environment which uh, the government is uh, doing best to build you know, in the whole industry environment, I still remember I entered this, this country first time it was in the end of uh, year 2015. The Prime Minister mentioned once he is planning to build the I, uh, hub in this South uh, Asia, South and East Asian area. So for that hub building, I think you know the ICT hub should be the first step. It means if we build this beautiful island as an ICT hub, definitely will contribute huge uh, increase in terms of in terms of uh, uh, GDP growth. So how important is innovation in the context of technology? So if you look at the Sri Lanka's uh, uh, society, I also see a lot of efforts in terms of innovation, in terms of focus you know, in, in innovation in this market. No matter from the government side, I feel that from the all of our prime minister, ministers of uh, telecommunication, even minister of uh, strategic development, all of them, they are doing their best to build the better environment which can uh, increase the development of technologies like uh, uh, industry park you know, plan, technology park plan and also make a better environment for the uh, foreign you know, investment coming in. They are very good effort, actions actually. What are the, some of the major technology trends that you are seeing both locally in Sri Lanka and globally? Uh, that's a very good question actually. If you look at currently 4G, 4.5G in terms of uh, telecommunication uh, industry and also the IoT, Internet of Things is also very popular in this ICT uh, industry. But if you look at the near future, the 5G, the fifth generation technology and also the uh, virtual reality also very very hot topic if we can put the 5G commercial use and also the virtual reality put a you know, popular use 
definitely will help people, you know, not only enrich the life of their quality, but also increase a lot of efficiency, no matter from the life side or from the you know, work side. In Sri Lanka, the TRC or the Telecommunication Regulatory Commission uh, processes and issues permits. It's involved in tariff regulations, pricing policies, and also the monitoring of service providers. How is the regulatory environment broadly impacting uh, communication technology in general? Very, very important. I mean, the regulations in terms of uh, build a better and open environment for this industry's uh, growth. In fact, I would like to suggest, take this opportunity, would like to suggest um, for the infrastructure sharing, for the existing infrastructure is most important, which can definitely contribute a lot to boost this industry's development. Another suggestion is the coordination of the new infrastructure built out. For example, no matter you build a new road or new construction or new building, even a new complex. But we put the ICT design in this plan. For example, put the fiber optical network inside of the complex and also along the road. It will save a lot of cost and also help the whole industry can build the plan. Like uh, Sri Lanka government had a very good plan for the digital uh, Sri Lanka. So if we put this kind of plan and this kind of design, ICT design, in our new infrastructure, then we can save manpower, electricity power, even water, transportation, a lot of cost, which can really boost our national broadband, our digital societies, you know, building, all of them. So in your opinion, what are the main challenges faced by tech companies? Challenges always you know, exist. If you look at the current situation for the technology companies, first of all, is the human resource, especially the talent people. Talent people from two you know, uh, factors. One is the talent people for, res for research and uh, development. Another kind of talent people is for leading the industries development, which has that power, has that vision, has that passion, you know, to lead this industry, this technology industry's development. In fact, I would like to thanks, you know, uh, take my thanks to Dr. Hans, the former CEO of Dialog. Currently, he is the uh, Southern uh, Asian Areas uh, CEO of uh, Ashata group. He was the leading person in terms of uh, technology you know, development in this country. He not only just knows about technology and the trend of technology, but he has that vision, he has that power, he has the passion to push and to lead the whole industry's development. That's one kind of talent. In fact, that's one kind of challenge. And the second challenge is about the uh, investment for the ICT's development. Now, the whole country, especially from the government side, they are prefer you know, to have the PPP model you know, for the investment for the whole industry's development. Yes, PPP model is a very popular and a very effective model. But one challenge is, where is the investment come from? Especially the investment in the rural area in terms of infrastructure, in terms of broadband. As everybody knows, the return of the investment in the rural area is lower, much lower than in urban area. But as the equality of, you know, human rights 
definitely no matter who is living in the rural area, they have that right to enjoy the broadband because this is a very, very important human right. It can give you a, a chance to realize your dream, to realize your dream to seek your happiness, your family's happiness, and also that chance to know everywhere to create you know, your dream. We'll be continuing with our discussion, Shunli. Um, we now pause for some commercials on the other side. Shunli Wang uh, discusses about camera technology, how it's impacting consumer expectations, and also the demand or the lack of demand for wearable technology. So do stay with us. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. LMD is making waves, airwaves. The next big thing from Sri Lanka's pioneering business journal, LMD Podcast, now online. Listen to our articles on the go at www.lmd.lk. Select, play, listen. It's that simple. We understand that savings provide for life's special moments. That's why we were the first bank to introduce an incentivized savings scheme, Patum Vimana. We changed how a nation felt about savings because we believe in banking beyond transactions. HNB, your partner in progress. And so we continue our discussion on communication technology with the CEO of Huawei Technologies, Lanka, Shunli Wang. Uh, Shunli, camera technology, it has evolved a great deal since cameras were first introduced into mobile phones. How is it impacting the mobile space? Camera with uh, cell phones is amazing things you know, happening. I say uh, every smartphone with good cameras is making a stage for everybody. So everybody can enjoy your life through that camera. Like uh, sharing, you know, the beautiful things and uh, expose, you know, the bad things together. Everybody now making a beautiful and safety, you know, world for everyone, everybody in this world and also for every society. I like the, you know, this kind of uh, feeling. This is a, uh, is a, uh, how to say, is fantastic. Yeah. In terms of technology, how have customer expectations, aspirations evolved? Actually, most of the people, they don't know exactly what they want in terms of products. But people never stop their dream in terms of seeking you know, good life, good future, and also self-achievement. Currently, you know, the ICT technology definitely help people to make them dream reality. And also through this technology, also help people not only you know learn from this world but also 
create some new, some new approaches, which also can help the whole life of their families. For example, the virtual reality is very popular. It's, a, it's one way, you know, to change the people in terms of learning knowledges. You make the video, right, and put it on in the internet, then everybody can get that knowledge once he has that opportunity to access the internet and get that video. And also, for example, in the classroom, especially in the rural area, they don't have enough resource in terms of teachers, they don't have enough resource in terms of very qualified teachers, but they can get the video in terms of teaching materials, and these teaching materials can share by the whole country. No matter you, in, you are in the urban area or in the rural area, then it can improve the efficiency in terms of knowledge transfer, in terms of training people to get new technologies. You know, we're seeing activity trackers, we're seeing smart watches, we're seeing a host of smart electronic devices. How has wearable technology impacted the mobile space? And also, is it just a fad or do you think it's going to continue? It's very good and it's a very good feeling to have that uh, wearable, you know, uh, products. It's not just on, only a fashion, but also this is the trend and also this is the new driver in terms of new technologies development. Not only for the technology part, but also it's a driver to the other industries. For example, normally for the variables products, the size is small, right? And also the, the, the battery is sustainable, should be longer. And also, as you mentioned, fashion. All of this one needs, you know, the technology development in terms of craft. And also in terms of the, the accuracy, technology, timing for the, like for the health products, it can give you very, very good feeling in terms of improve your quality of life. So what can we look forward to in terms of the future of technology? As a personal, my opinion, you know, very, very optimistic. I always believe uh, as the development of technology definitely can help people in terms of uh, uh, digital divide uh, bridging and also in terms of uh, help people to solve the very old problems like uh, poverty like a uh, you know uh, disease so with the new technology increase the quality of life and also help people you know avoid the the main disease which uh, suffer the people you know for several centuries so this is what i believe but also i believe as a development of technology it will give us, everyone in this globe, a chance, a chance for success, a chance for happiness seeking, a chance for equality of freedom. That freedom, not only just personal freedom, is a freedom of success of personal, freedom of success of society. Well, that certainly is a wonderful role for communication technology to play. I just hope it does become more than reality. Thank you very much, Shunli, for joining us. Thank you so much. It's my uh, pleasure. So discussing communication technology with us on Benchmark today was Shunli Wang, the CEO of Huawei Technologies, Lanka. On the other side, Anushan Selvaraja will discuss more issues.
Finance. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. LMD is making waves, airwaves. The next big thing from Sri Lanka's pioneering business journal, LMD Podcast, now online. Listen to our articles on the go at www.lmd.lk. Select, play, listen. It's that simple. Nearly 60% of all businesses in our country are SMEs. Some of our most growth-oriented financial solutions have been customized to serve this sector. That's why we have invested over 500 billion rupees to support the backbone of our economy. Because we believe in banking beyond transactions. HNB, your partner in progress. Welcome back to the show. I'm Anushan Selvaraja. Now for a closer look at the latest on the Business Confidence Index. Joining me is the Managing Director of Nielsen, Sharan Park. Welcome back to the show, Sharan. Now, the BCI has remained broadly flat despite the country receiving the GSP Plus concession. Uh, what are the reasons behind this? Yes, so as expected, the sentiments are more or less flat. Uh, the BCI has just moved up marginally to 119 uh, in the month of May versus the level of 117 in the month of April. Uh, this is largely because the macroeconomic condition is still not very conducive. That's what the business leaders are saying. It's not very conducive for investment, for business growth as such. The drought-induced inflation is increasing every day. In fact, in the month of April, it had reached 8.4. That's almost doubled in the uh, last six months. The food inflation has gone beyond the uh, double digits now it's uh, reaching its teens and that's causing a lot of pressure on the consumers when it comes to consumption and the increasing interest rates are causing pressure on the business leaders on running their businesses so this is what is driving or uh, impacting the business confidence as such where do respondents stand in terms of our business and economic prospects well the economic uh, prospects are still not looking that positive uh, only about 21% of the business leaders feel that the economy might improve in the next 12 months. This number stood at 28% in the month of April. The reasons are still the same. The macroeconomic condition is not very conducive and therefore it's still not looking that positive for the economy in general. What about our investment prospects as well as uh, uh, future plans for, for the workforce? So when it comes to business prospects, uh, the leaders feel that the short term uh, prospects are still not very strong. Only 21% of them say that the immediate quarter might be strong. Uh, this again is due to the impact that we are seeing on consumption in different sectors, be it fast moving consumer goods or durables or telecom, all getting impacted because of taxes and inflation. So short term impact, negative. When it comes to long term, uh, surprisingly, about 40% of them say that the business might improve in the next 12 months. Now, this could be because of the GSP Plus. They might feel that there will be increase in orders and therefore the business will improve. Coming back to investments, uh, it's still a wait and watch game. Uh, large number of business leaders, about 50% of them say that it's a fair environment, not really talking very positive, but saying, calling it as a fair investment environment. Uh, again, some positive uh, outcomes coming from GSP Plus, which might improve the business outlook. One interesting thing that leaders talk about is around the strikes that we are seeing in Sri Lanka. What they say that it impacts the image of the country and that creates an image of lack of ease of doing business. So they want the government to address that particular issue so as to improve the investment prospects in the future. Another interesting point is about 26% of the leaders feel that they would be increasing their workforce in the near future. This could be because of GSP Plus coming into play and they feel that they might need more on the workforce front in order to take care of those increasing orders. Thank you very much for joining us, Sharan. My pleasure. That was the Managing Director of Nielsen, Sharan Park. We'll be right back after a short commercial break. Stay tuned.
When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. LMD is making waves, airwaves. The next big thing from Sri Lanka's pioneering business journal, LMD Podcast, now online. Listen to our articles on the go at www.lmd.lk. Select, play, listen. It's that simple. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. Gami Pubudua, our microfinance offering, makes it possible for the youth of this country who have a viable business plan but lack the funds to realize their dreams. We are committed to grassroots level entrepreneur development because we believe in banking beyond transactions. HNB. Your partner in progress. Welcome back to the show. I'm Amishan Salvarajan. Now for a closer look at the latest on the economy. Joining me is economist and LMD columnist Shiran Fernando. Welcome back to the show, Shiran. Now, uh, how is Sri Lanka as a country performing on the uh, foreign investment front? Uh, pleasure to be back again. Um, so, it's two sides. You have the foreign investors coming into the local government securities market. And that has recently uh, reversed this previous trend where we saw a lot of outflows uh, from the bills in the bonds market and now gradually we are seeing a bit of inflow coming back and that is more of a reflection of uh, what foreign investors are feeling in terms of emerging markets uh, right now rather than anything Sri Lanka specific. Um, in terms of the FDI, we uh, last year I think just registered a billion again which is similar to what we had in the previous year so not much, too much of a change. Uh, but there is certainly, I think, uh, interest um, for investment. If you s uh, go by the roadshows that we do um, recently as well, there was an investment conclave. So there is a lot of interest uh, among foreigners trying to set up joint ventures or fresh equity investments. But uh, we're yet to see it sort of panning out as yet. According to the Central Bank annual report, government revenue as a, uh, as a share of GDP increased last year. Now, could you just elaborate on this? Yes, so um, I think the, the initiative with the IMF program has been to raise revenues uh, and this has been on a declining trend for a while. Um, so what we did see was, so total revenue consists of tax revenue and non-tax revenue. So tax revenue, things like income taxes, excise taxes, um, those kind of taxes. And then you have the non-tax revenue which is comprising of profits made by state-owned enterprises, uh, dividends that you know some of these SOEs make you share it with the government, so it comes in as non-tax revenue. So what we saw was tax revenue actually staying uh, about the same amount, um, because though we did see VAT sort of going up and VAT increasing, we saw a decrease also in excise taxes because of uh, the number of acres being imported was far less uh, with the, with the uh, duty being raised up. So those sort of two counterbalance. So tax revenue didn't really grow too much, but it didn't fall either. Um, whereas you saw an increase in non-tax revenue which boosted you know, total revenue to above 14% which we have not seen uh, for a, a quite a while now. Our per capita GDP has remained flat, uh, what are the sensitivities behind this? Um, so that's a noticeable thing that you've seen in the last two years where we've still not crossed, crossed that 3,900 to 4,000 level per capita GDP number. Um, so one of the reasons I think is because of the movement in the currency that we've seen. So from about 2015, we've depreciated about 15%. Um, so that has an impact when you make this, it's a, make this calculation. Um, the other thing as well is that 
we're not uh, no longer growing six seven percent as well so four four five percent is not that much of a growth uh, at the moment uh, plus there's also population increases that you've seen as well so a bunch of these factors have sort of seen GDP per capita getting stagnated at this point so it needs real uh, growth drivers as well as maybe a stable currency to sort of go beyond that 4,000 mark. So how is Sri Lanka performing in terms of handling its national debt? Um, well, it's an ongoing um, story that's sort of uh, going on with the uh, level of debt. Um, right now I think there's a bit of controversy in terms of the way it's classified. So. Yes, but there's a standing argument at the moment between the Auditor General and the Finance Ministry uh, saying that uh, the percentage of uh, debt to GDP is not right. Uh, what do you have to say about this? It's the way you classify, I think. So, because a lot of uh, the, the common debt that we sort of report at 78% does not take into account certain foreign loans as well as some of the SOE debt, which are sometimes taken off balance sheet. Uh, and sort of, you know, because it has government guarantees, it does not sort of fall under the main debt to GDP number. Uh, so, I think the difference from 70 to 80 to 83 is not that much, but. But it's a significant amount of it, it, cash, it, a lot of money. In terms of money, it is a lot, but in terms of uh, percentage-wise, it doesn't change the fact that we're still a heavy uh, debt burden economy. So it doesn't change that fact too much because it's just 78 to 80. If you're going from 78 to say 100 percent or even above, that that's a significant move. Up. Yeah, but then it's still a, an amount that we need to be paying back. That's so true. That's it's a large amount. Which that's true. That's true. What what is happening? So on that front, I think what they're trying to sort of do is in particular with some of the commercial borrowing is uh, to ease that debt uh, schedule up a bit. So the government is sort of talking about, you know, maybe uh, re uh, re retiring some of the bonds that are sort of maturing. You need FDI to come in because a lot of the growth story in the last few years has been very much debt driven. We can't sort of pursue that. Um, and also get more profitable because some of these SOEs uh, need to stop being like a laggard towards uh, the, the main government budget so that has been the problem over the last few years and curtailing things like spending and a bit more prudency in fiscal management so all those factors I think will sort of help bring this down over a period of time because it's not a one year where we're going to suddenly reduce it. Thank you very much for joining us Shiran. Pleasure. That was Economist and LMB columnist Shiran Fernando. Thank you for watching Benchmark and we hope to see you again next time.